From humble beginnings to the halls of power in Washington, Julian Castro was born in 1974 in San Antonio, Texas, just one minute apart from his twin brother, Joaquin. They were both raised by their mother, Rosie, a Mexican-American civil rights activist. Julian went on to Stanford University and Harvard Law School before returning to his roots, becoming the youngest San Antonio City Council member ever elected at age 26. He lost his first bid for mayor of San Antonio in 2005, but he ran again in 2009 and won. You are going to own City Hall when I'm mayor of San Antonio. He took the national stage in 2012 to deliver the keynote speech at the Democratic National Convention. Thank you. The first Latino to do so. It's not every day that you get a call from the president asking you if you want a job. At only 39, Julian joined President Obama's cabinet as the youngest member, serving as the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. His twin brother, Joaquin, also ascending the political ladder, currently representing Texas in Congress. Julian, now running for president, plans to challenge President Trump with his progressive platform, including Medicare for All, police reform, and fighting climate change. All right. So let's get right back to the questions from the audience, shall we? Mike Langley has our next question. Mike. Good afternoon, Secretary. Good afternoon. We have seen a few mayors and a few former mayors enter this race. So I was curious, how was your experience as a, as a former mayor and cabinet secretary prepared you for, to run for president? How and why? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be one of the few folks in this race that has real executive experience as a cabinet secretary. And I also served as mayor of San Antonio, the seventh largest city in our country. And one of the reasons I think that folks are looking more to people that have mayoral experience these days is because mayor is all about getting things done, right? The mayor is the person that gets the calls about uh, streets that needs to be fixed or uh, fire response that's not fast enough or police response that's not fast enough. Um, what are you going to do to create more economic opportunity, more jobs in this community? And so people are able to measure you very easily by whether you get things done. I have a track record of getting things done. So when I talk about my plan, for instance, for education, uh, I've actually worked on that. When I was mayor of San Antonio, for instance, uh, we put to the voters a ballot initiative called Pre-K for SA to raise the sales tax by an eighth of a cent uh, to significantly expand high quality full day pre-K in our city. And, uh, you know, we're in Texas. so. People wondered whether people would support an eighth of a cent tax sales tax increase. But you know what? I had to work with people that agreed with me and people that disagreed with me, people in the business community, people that were in the education community and activists to get that thing passed. And it did pass. And today, because of that, San Antonio has one of the best pre-K programs in all of the United States and is better educating its young people. That's the kind of track record of actually doing things, of getting things done that I believe my experience as mayor and cabinet secretary helps prepare me for being president. Mr. Secretary, uh, today a federal watchdog agency recommended that White House Counselor Kellyanne Conway be fired for violating the Hatch Act, essentially campaigning while in federal office. When you were HUD secretary, the same agency accused you of the same thing. Uh, president Obama gave you a pass. Should President Trump give Kellyanne Conway a pass? Thank you for the question. Um, let, me, let me just uh, explain sort of what happened back then. And also, let me apply that to the political climate that I think that we have today. Uh, so in 2016, when Hillary Clinton was running, I was doing an interview at the HUD studio, uh, I think with Katie Couric. And um, we were talking about HUD business, about housing. And, and then she asked me a question about the presidential race. And I said, well, just let me put on my other hat. And, and I talked about why I supported Hillary Clinton. Um, somebody complained that that was a violation of the Hatch Act. And, you know, we consulted with our HUD general counsel. And they said, you know what, that, that, that is. And so I said, I made a mistake. I'm going to make sure that I admit that and that we will do everything that we can so that I understand where those lines are and that everybody else on my team understands where those lines are. I think it's important for leaders to be able to acknowledge when they've made mistakes and then to be able to take proper action to correct that. 
The difference between me and Kellyanne Conway is, and the Office of Special Counsel pointed this out, she violated the Hatch Act, and instead of saying, okay, look, I'm going to take these efforts to make sure that doesn't happen again, she said, to hell with it. I'm going to keep doing it. They said that she had repeatedly done that. That's the difference. I don't, I don't think that we're going to find anybody, either in this race or in our homes and in our community, that has never made mistakes. The true test of a leader is, what do you do when you make that mistake? Are you big enough to own up to it and then make sure that you correct what you do in the future? Or do you do basically what she did, which is to say, no, I'm bigger than that. No, she did the wrong thing. And I support the Office of Special Counsel's determination that because she repeatedly violated it, even though she was clearly told that it was a violation, that she should be removed from office. But in reality, you're pretty sure she won't be. So our next question comes from Scott Meyer. Scott, there you are. Good afternoon, sir. Under our current administration, the worldview of America is less appealing. If elected, what would you do to improve our international relations while still keeping America as a strong power in our diplomacy? Thank you very much uh, for that question. You know, I grew up during a time of a lot of uh, geopolitical change. Uh, I remember uh, when the Berlin Wall came down. Uh, I remember the beginning, of course, of uh, the first Gulf War, of the second. Um, I believe that we have a lot of cleaning up to do, frankly, when this president is gone. This president has uh, torn apart some of the strongest alliances that we have as a country. My first order of business would be to repair those alliances with our European allies, whether it's the UK, it's France, it's Germany. I mean, these alliances have been a big reason that this world has been safer and that we have been better off as a country. Uh, I would also repair some of the damage that I think has been done to our relationship with places like Canada. I mean, who gets into a fight with Canada? All right? <laughs> but somehow, this president did. And the relationship that we have with Canada and Mexico is so important for uh, our security and also economically. Uh, and it's more important than ever that we have allies around the world because we have countries like China that are growing very quickly that are projected to get stronger and stronger militarily and economically. It's estimated that in 2030, that if nothing changes, that China is going to eclipse us as the largest economy in the world. I believe that we need to do everything that we can to make sure that we're as strong as possible economically and also to protect ourselves militarily. Um, I also believe that the United States does have a role to play in furthering the values that have made our nation special. Freedom, democracy, opportunity, equality for people around the world. Uh, that doesn't mean that we should get entangled in unnecessary conflicts. We saw what a mistake Iraq was. But it does mean that we should not be cozying up to dictators like the dictator in North Korea or uh, other countries that this president can't seem to get it right with. Uh, I would return to a time when the United States leads on things like human rights and pushing for freedom and democracy and equality. Mr. Secretary, um, obviously the president says that he's engaged in all of this pushback with those countries, including Canada, because he says that they're taking uh, advantage of, of our economic situation. One of the big topics, obviously, in recent days, you touched on it, China, and the trade war, possibly expanding trade war with China that's ongoing. The president hit Joe Biden the other day for flipping on how he talked about China. Uh, here's what he said in May and then earlier this week. China is going to eat our lunch Come on, man. They're not bad folks, folks. But guess what? They're not a they're, they're not, not they're competition for us. China poses real challenges to the United States and in uh, uh, some ways a real threat to the United States. But Donald Trump is only exacerbating the threat and the danger. So which one is right? Joe Biden in May or Joe Biden this week? Well, look, uh, I'm not going to address what other people are talking about. What I can tell you is what I believe. What I believe is that, uh, that China, what I, what I think is that, that China is um, a competitor, 
uh, that right now it's forging alliances in places like Africa and in Latin America, making investments in those countries. And that means that we need to be smart about forging our own alliances. I can say, for instance, that I believe that if I were elected president, that I would have a unique and unprecedented opportunity to forge a stronger relationship with Mexico and with Latin America that would benefit us in the long run, both in terms of security and economic development. And um, to also focus on uh, the Pacific region, to make sure that we're doing that as we understand both the challenges and the opportunities of the 21st century. And so, yeah, I think that, that, uh, that China is a competitor, that, that we have to have smart policy around. Take a look at Iran. Uh, obviously, big news today with regard to that. Secretary Pompeo saying that he believes that they were behind two attacks on two tankers. There were another uh, two tankers that were attacked in recent weeks. Also, the attack at the Saudi Arabia airport with a missile strike. Uh, put yourself in the Oval Office today, on this day, June 13th. You're looking at this situation. As president, how do you respond? How do you de-escalate what's going on there and not risk a war? Well, and I think in your question uh, that you hit right on what we have to do, which is to work to de-escalate situations like this, to avert a war. The issue that I have with this administration is that uh, they seem to be hell-bent on moving us toward war with Iran. And the first step of that was withdrawing from the Iran nuclear agreement. The Iran nuclear agreement was the best, strongest agreement that we had to make sure that a country did not develop the capacity to launch a nuclear weapon. And instead of embracing that and making sure, as all of the intel intelligence agencies said, that uh, Iran continued to abide by the terms of the agreement, this president haphazardly came in and said, you know what, we're going to throw that out the window. That makes the situation in Iran less stable. It makes it more likely that we're going to get into conflict, which I don't believe in. And it sends a signal to the rest of the world, including places like North Korea, that even if we engage in diplomatic efforts and move towards some sort of agreement that will keep them from developing further their nuclear capacity, that we're not going to honor it. But, but my question is, what do you do today? Okay, yeah, given what's going on, you've got tankers that are that are on fire. We're evacuating people. There's a military operation essentially to evacuate these people. Um, so, what are you going to do in this moment to fix this situation to solve it? What would you do today? Number one, we always need to make sure that that our folks are safe, that our personnel are safe, that they have what they need. We're going to support them over there. Uh, secondly, uh, we need to engage our allies and put pressure on Iran through sanctions and other ways to ensure that they don't act in an aggressive way. Well, the administration has done that. One of the choices would be to relieve, to relieve those sanctions. Is that anything that you would consider in this moment? Look, I'm not privy to all of the intelligence information, obviously, that, that uh, Mike Pompeo is or the president is. Um, but I believe that this conflict with Iran has been ginned up and that we're moving down a path that seems familiar from the past that has led to a lot of turmoil in that region. And so I would do everything that I could to work with our allies to try and avoid further escalation, but to you, try and de-escalate that. You know what they say, the administration. They say the reason Iran is acting this way is because the sanctions are squeezing them. And they're acting out, and these fires are real. It's not fake. The oil tankers were on fire today. So that's, that's the genesis of the question. Uh, again, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that we need to ease up on sanctions. However, um, the mistake that this president made was changing the relationship that we had in terms of the Iran nuclear agreement that was in place. What he did was basically break apart the, the positive forward progress that we had with Iran that was abided. All of the intelligence agencies said that they were abiding by the terms of that agreement. It was an effective agreement. And then, unfortunately, this president came in and said, no, we're not going to abide by it. And I think that that has led to the instability that we see today. We have another question. Michelle Rose is uh, the next question. Michelle? Secretary Castro, how would you lessen the amount of use of excessive force by law enforcement? And do you support civilian review boards with subpoena and firing power? Thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, you know, I said a few days ago that um, earlier this year I was in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And I was a few blocks away from the Mother Emanuel AME Church, where in 2015 Dylan Roof went in when people were worshiping in that church and he murdered nine people. 
And then a few hours later, he was apprehended without incident, as I believe he should be apprehended without incident, taken into custody, taken to trial, and punished. Uh, but then what about Eric Garner? And what about Stefan Clark? And what about Jason Perro? And what about Sandra Bland? And what about Tamir Rice? And what about Laquan McDonald? And what about Pamela Turner? And what about Antonio Arce here in Tempe, Arizona? But too often times, too often times we have seen um, police mistreat, especially young men of color, a lot of young black men. Right? How many of these videos do we have to watch? I don't care what your politics is, whether you're liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican. We're in an age of technology where you see the video now. How many of these videos do you have to watch before we understand that even though we have some great police officers, and I worked with some of them as mayor of San Antonio, that this is not a problem of a few bad apples. The system itself is broken, and we need to fix it. And that's why I've... <laughs> that's why, you know, I proposed this police reform plan. Nobody else on the campaign trail has done this, but I was proud to do it because I'm going to speak up for the voices of folks who often don't get somebody to speak up for them. And it's called for um, things like greater accountability through these review boards, through a use of force standard, that says, uh, basically, that police departments shall not use lethal force unless all other reasonable alternatives in the situation have been expended, um, and that holds them accountable for those actions, that creates more transparency, that ensures that police departments have the support they need to recruit as well as possible, right, and to retain the best officers, and does things like that are simple and straightforward, like create a database of police officers that have been decertified. You know that right now, we don't have a, a federal database that shows which police officers have been decertified because they engaged in egregious misconduct. So an officer, you've probably seen this in the past, an officer can commit misconduct here and then go the next town over, too oftentimes, and get a job when they shouldn't in the first place. So these are simple but powerful things right, to make Secretary, sure that we improve our policing. If I could just ask you a follow-up on that, from, perhaps from the other side of that equation. Last night, you had 25 police officers in Memphis. People threw rocks and bricks at them uh, after they took, um, after a man's life, after a man was killed, in a situation where they were trying to bring in a fugitive. According to the reports, he rammed into the police cars uh, with his car and the situation un unfolded. You've also got a 26 percent increase in the number of police officers who are killed in the line of duty in the most recent numbers. So what do you say to those families of law enforcement who look at your program of, of people first and say, this police officer who's part of my family is, is also a person? I agree with that. And uh, first of all, I say uh, thank you and God bless you uh, to the service that you're giving to the community. And I know that, as I said, that we have a lot of police officers who are doing a good job in our country. I saw that as mayor of San Antonio. Um, but what I also will say is that, um, and I know this as a former public servant, public servants, whether they're a mayor or uh, a police officer, public servants work for the public. The public doesn't work for them. Right? They serve the public. And we need to make sure we need to make sure that just like with every other profession, that we continue to improve that profession. The thing about being a police officer is that you quite literally have the life and death of people in your hands. And so we need to respect what they do. Um, we honor their service. You also wake up every morning with the possibility that you might not go home at the end of the day. That is, that and, is very and true. that happens a lot, too. And, and I just think that some of them might hear what you say and feel, you know, that they are being made, made the enemy and feel not that at all. that's not fair. Not at all. Uh, and that's why I am always clear about the fact that I know that there are good police officers out there. But I also know that I've seen too many of these videos, read too many newspaper articles, heard from too many people out there in our country especially young black men who are being treated differently because of who they are. And that is not acceptable in the United States. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much.